Hello from Australia. You're listening to Listen More with Paige Crystal Wilcox. This is a podcast where I listen to people from around the world about what they'd like to see less and more of in media representations of people like themselves. Would you care to introduce yourself, please? Thank you so much, Paige, for the opportunity to, you know, just put myself out there and, you know, talk about my feelings on media and, you know, proper, accurate representation. So my name is Zane Landon. My pronouns are he and his. Uh, I'm actually currently a student. I attend Cal Poly Pomona, which is a polytechnic university in California studying communication with an emphasis in public relations. So I've been learning a bit about, you know, media studies and the role of media and how quintessential it is how it plays out with culture and how we view things and see things. People will admit that, you know, media is powerful. It's not this conglomerate that's like propaganda. That was like kind of like debunked (laughs) that it's not that powerful to persuade opinion like that. But I think it's really important how we see people and how we respect others. And when we see people with accurate representations on TV or through the media, you just learn that they're just people. And I think it's it really is that simple. I know it sounds like media is this complicated mess, but I really think if you can just have good intentions and put people on the screen with their positive stories that, and I mean positive as like just sharing the truth, you know, I think we could see a, a culture shift, a global one. People will be treated maybe better and also they'll just be seen differently. And it will even influence the language we use and how we see people. So that's my passion for media and for my specific identities. I identify with the LGBTQ community. So I'm always shifting <laughs> on what yeah. exactly my identity is, identities are, but um, I mean, I, I always go from the whole gay, bi, pansexual. I never can decide. I mean, why do I need to? I mean, you even see people who are gender... Fluid? Yeah, so gender fluid is a thing. I think sexual fluid is a thing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> absolutely. So... I mean, it's your identity. So what you feel is right is right. Yeah, so some, t- some days I'll identify as... I mean, never straight. But I'll identify as sometimes gay. Well, I'll feel predominantly that way. Or sometimes I'll even identify as bisexual or pansexual. It really depends on how I'm feeling. I'll start off with that because I have other identities. But I think this one I really want to talk about first. But that's actually something I would love to see in media more is the play on bisexuality and pansexuality to show that, again, sexual fluidity is a thing and that you really don't need to be one or the other. I don't I think we're kind of in this era where we're kind of removing binary identities. <laughs> and even though I see movement behind the not seeing gender as a binary, I still think we're a little bit seeing sexuality still as a binary, though. Because even though people like claim that bisexuality and pansexuality exist, I still see biphobia and panphobia within the LGBTQ community. And so I actually think starting there is really important. (laughs) You know, how do we actually allow people to embrace that they're not straight or gay, that they're something else, pansexual or bisexual. And that's to me is something I want to see more because even when I see it in TV, I remember watching the show Revenge. I never finished it, but I got towards the end and there was one character, I don't remember his name. He was with a guy in one season, then the next season he's in love with a woman. And I loved that because it was just so natural. It wasn't, his bisexuality wasn't his identity either. You know, like it was just him. It wasn't this big deal which I thought was it just felt so natural like I was like oh you know he's just a person on this show who happens to be bisexual and I thought was it just it just felt so great that's how I wish reality was like you know someone's gay it's like oh okay whatever but I love seeing that that was like the one time I probably saw bisexuality on tv where I could identify with because it's like it seems to me that or pansexuality because to me it seemed like he really just love the person and not the gender, the age, whatever it was. And I just love seeing that people can just have this human connection and they're not, they're not, you know, binded by gender and stuff. I actually just talked about this with someone about not using LGBTQ as a token or a trope for comedy. I thought that was pretty interesting Um, because, you know, we were talking about that. He mentioned like that, you know, you'll see like a lot of times you'll see gay men on TV and you'll see them as a means to be flamboyant and funny and, I don't like that because I'm nothing like that. And a lot of gay people aren't like that. I wish they would give us just people, you know, not tropes to like fulfill a certain requirement. And also when you do that, sometimes it feels like they're filling out like the diversity quota. (laughs) But I love seeing, you know, people who are LGBTQ on TV that don't fit the stereotype. One of my favorite shows is Degrassi. And like they have two characters who are gay, Riley and Zane. And they're really, they're masculine. It's like the straight acting kind of, but they're not playing the straight acting. It just seems like that. They're like into sports. And to me, I love that because again, it's kind of getting rid of that traditional stereotype that we've seen for years that people who are gay or within LGBTQ can't like sports or they can't like 
things that are traditionally masculine or traditionally feminine, you know, for women. And so it's like, it's very interesting. And I like seeing that. That whole arc was like 10 years ago when Degrassi filmed it. I feel like they were kind of ahead of its time. <laughs> Uh, but that's definitely one of my favorite shows on how it's portrayed certain issues. But other than that, I'll be honest, I have not seen many representations of LGBTQ that I could kind of relate to. But I would love to see, of course, just more more characters who identify that way. And again, don't fit the stereotype or play the stereotype. Yeah, so that's definitely how I feel about <laughs> LGBTQ, the community, and what I really hope for it. And I really hope, you know... Putting more LGBTQ characters on TV will just show people that they're just people. They just like someone different. And even, of course, other identities, you know, stuff we don't see either, like, you know, like asexuality. The idea that people are sexual beings when there are many people that don't identify that way and exploring what that means. You know, what's a little hard about LGBTQ is there's so many identities and same with disability. And so try, trying to get accurate representation for a lot of groups, I think, is a huge challenge. That does not mean I'm saying don't. I'm saying, no, let's go full force and do it. But you also have to make sure you're not just overrepresenting certain groups like gay men. And then so my other identity I would like to talk about is like my mental health and having depression. I got really passionate about disability rights when I was in high school. Throughout my life, I was on like a 504 plan. So like K through 12, I don't know if in Australia, if that's what it's called. But like the K through 12 system, you'll be on an individualized plan. That sounds like an IEP. But I was on a 504 plan, which basically just meant I was getting accommodations um, when I was in school, K through 12. But like my family never disclosed what my disability was. I don't even know if I really, I don't know if I had one. I, but then people say you must have because you had to have one to be on a 504. So I, it's interesting that I never really knew. Um, but I know I had like a, not necessarily learning, but I had attention issues, social issues. I had a lot of different things to navigate growing up. <laughs> but lately, what I've been experiencing is mental health. And I actually took a semester off two years ago. It wasn't a good time. I was actually in my first relationship and I don't think I knew exactly how to handle that. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of issues and there was a lot of different things to navigate. But anyways, uh, I just wasn't in a good place. I wasn't doing well in school. I was participating in self-harm, which was really bad. I just needed the time off. And so what I do wish for media when it comes to disability and especially mental health, gosh, we can talk about mental health because mental health has been treated really badly in the media to the point where it's been excused for horrible things, but also it's been, it's been a, it's been a blame game for it too, which I find really interesting. Like you'll have people that like, so something really bad will happen and say, oh, it was their mental health when we don't know that for sure. Um, and if it really was, then yes, then we need to get that person help. But then sometimes I'll see people say, oh, of course they would do that. They have mental health. They have schizophrenia. So of course they're going to beat someone. I, when I hear that, I'm just like, it's so weird that you'll get like complete opposite opinions on something like that, like so extreme. When in reality, <laughs> the facts show that people who have mental health and mental illnesses are actually more likely to be violated and abused than someone who doesn't have mental health. But it's really interesting how it's almost the reverse of what we're seeing. So one thing I do wish is that I wish they would stop playing the trope of mental health as like this, this essence for violence. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many films where like people with mental health are viewed as violent and just horrible people. And in reality, I'm pretty sure that's like an incredibly, incredibly small minority of people who have mental health. Of course, there are people with mental health who are violent, just like there's regular people out there who are violent. I mean, that's just how it is. But the majority of them are not like that. And when you put that on TV and someone goes, oh, I have schizophrenia or I have PTSD or whatever it is. And then when, when you see that on TV, you're like, oh, so you're like violent. And I've seen, I've seen some shows, again, like Degrassi being one of them and other shows where they actually do depict mental health in a very pretty accurate way where they show how it can empower people. They can show how it actually hurts people. And also they show that what I want to show more is that, you know, you may have mental health problems and that may be what's hindering you, but a lot of the times it's, it's society hindering you because society isn't understanding of your condition. And that's like, what's really interesting is like, there's like the medical model disability and there's like the social model. And the social model says that, you know, you're not disabled from your disability, you're disabled because of society's treatment of you. And I find that very interesting. Again, there's debate, there's definitely a middle ground between the two, but I see that though, where people are, you know, their disability hinders something, but it's even more worse when they're not accommodated or they're not being understood and people treat them differently. That's where I think the real, you know, disabling part comes from because of the way they're being treated and they're not receiving accommodations. And so that's definitely what I wish I could see more, you know, on TV and even the news. There's a lot of crimes that happen against people with disabilities and people with, you know, different mental health. 
um, disorders and you never really hear about it. Um, and even when you do, sometimes it's not for the right reasons. Or like I said, it's to push the narrative that people with mental health are violent. I really wish we move forward and accurately telling the stories of, you know, people with, with disabilities and mental health, especially mental health, with how stigmatized it is um, and just how misunderstood it is. You know, there are people who go to school for years understand mental health. So I can understand mental health is definitely, you know, dynamic and it's a complex identity. And so, but if we can start putting stories, simple stories that really tell the stories and also just, you know, teaching kids about this is what it means to have mental health. And, you know, it may not be a big deal. And this is just how they think differently. I think we could, again, we would see it another global shift and that, you know, the way people with mental health are treated throughout the world um, is really bad. Um, and I think media can play a huge role in that. Also, just putting people on the screen who already have that stuff, um, who, who, ha who identify with ha mental illness and disability and not putting someone who doesn't have it. I know that's like kind of controversial, but I really think that, you know, I wish we would see actors who are portraying mental health actually have it or actually experience mental health themselves so they can actually really tell what it's like. And it comes through in their performance, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I there's a lot of debate on, you know, if you're gonna have a trans character, have a trans actor, person with disability, make sure you have a person that actually has a disability. And that makes sense. Cause you know, they're, they are gonna tell the story the best way they possibly can. Um, and so I really hope we can just get more people um, on the screen who actually have these identities, but also behind the screen. I actually got to participate in this uh, really cool program. It was like Warner Media had a access bootcamp. And so they picked certain, they picked like 10 students. Was it 10? Yeah, for each program. And so I was chosen for, the disability organization, but they had um, uh, trans individuals there. They had Middle Easterners, um, I'm trying to think about indigenous folks, um, who else? Yeah, but it was very underrepresented, which I would describe those groups as the underrepresented of the underrepresented. <laughs> I always say that just because the underrepresented, I would say some are doing a good job with getting media attention and more portrayals of them on TV, which I think is good because it's obviously something we need. But when I even, even like me being, I'm Hispanic and I even rarely see Hispanics on television. Again, there's a lot of communities that I think we're doing a disservice by not allowing them to be on the screen. So anyways, the program was really cool. And we learned all about what it's like to create a TV show from like producing to filming, to getting actors, to public relations, all that stuff. And so we are seeing entertainment recruiting and putting more people with these diverse um, identities on the screen and behind the scenes too, because I mean, it's great. Yeah, you have representation on TV, but if you don't have writers who are writing the representation, you're not really achieving anything either because they're just going to be reading the lines and there's no experience, there's no authenticity there, you know, if hopefully that makes sense. And so, yeah, that's what I would say about my you know disability identities. I wish you would just see again, more accurate portrayals and not also inspiration porn. And so if not anyone's ever heard of the term inspiration porn, it's when you'll see depictions of people with disabilities in the media or even like social media or LinkedIn and stuff. And you'll see people support people with disabilities, but it's not in the best way. It's because you find them inspiring or you pity them um, instead of just treating them as a human that deserves that recognition. You know, I've seen some people with disabilities post that they graduated and the post skyrockets and gets like 60,000 likes, so much more than usual. I think that's amazing. But also I'm wondering, is it inspiration porn? Are they being pitied? Because I saw some of the comments and some were even saying, it's amazing that someone like that could graduate. See, that is when I'm like, that is your, I don't know, I don't know why, why not? Like, <laughs> Like, it's so interesting like and it's interesting because like even this person's disability had nothing to do with their intelligence but it doesn't even matter even if someone has a you know a disability that affects their intelligence it doesn't even matter why can't they graduate like why is that so different you know and someone even shared with me that they were in their first year of a phd program i think they finished their first semester and even like the dean was like i'm just really impressed and surprised that you've made it this far and i honestly i feel like these people think they're being nice and they have good intentions but again they really should just kind of sit back and be like, I would not want to hear that. Like, would you, would you want to hear that? That you've worked so hard and like, it sounds like, it doesn't sound like you're being considered because it's like, oh, I'm really surprised and impressed you're still here. It's like, well, why don't you think I could survive or achieve in graduate school because I'm blind or, I or I'm deaf or I have mental health? Like, 
what does it have to do with anything? <laughs> and if you think it has something to do with it, well, maybe we should be investing in accommodations and supporting these students as well if you really think it was going to be an issue. I'll just quickly touch on like just being Hispanic and multiracial. Um, I wish we would, I'm seeing more of diversity on TV, but I wish you would see more than, this is going to sound bad, but <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I wish you would see more than beyond just black and white. I, I don't mean that, actually, I do mean that literally like African-Americans and white people, but also just the black and white tropes of like, we talk about the binary, but I see that. I see a lot of white people on TV. I see a lot of black people on TV, of course, a lot more white people, but I wish you would just see more Hispanics, more Asians, more indigenous people, people from very underrepresented backgrounds that we don't see on TV as much. Even when I think about me, <laughs> like, you know, growing up, it's like, I don't know what I had of inspiring content for Hispanics besides like Dora the Explorer, whatever, or even like Nacho Libre. That's all I remember as a kid. I don't remember much else. And that could have been, you could say it's fault of my parents for not showing me Hispanic movies or, but whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. Like that stuff clearly wasn't popularized throughout the world. And so, you know, just, just seeing more of that. And just, again, all these things I've talked about, a lot of my identities, I'm the whole crux of it is just, just normalize it. So people can recognize that, you know, we are just people navigating the world just like them. And we're just, different. I mean, we're different because of what the majority has taught us, but in reality, we're not different at all. Like, we're all the same. Um, I mean, I don't, ugh, I don't want to say that because like, I don't, like, I know we're not literally all the same. We all have different accommodations, but we're all still people. We all still can have community, even if we're nonverbal, even if we can't speak, even if we can't hear, we communicate differently. We still all communicate and we still all can coexist. So I really appreciate all of your thoughts there. I think that's a great place to end it. I don't actually have anything to add because it, none of it's my story, but I, I, I feel very fortunate that I am connected to so many people who can speak to me about these sorts of things. And I'm really hopeful that there'll be writers or other types of content creators who will listen to these and just get that little bit closer to realising that characters can be person focused and they'll be a lot more authentic 